Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining Retail Merchandising Execution, Bridging the Execution Gap to Increase Revenues with Tom Erskine, CEO, Wondor. As a reminder, if you have any questions throughout the conversation, to please submit them using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Here's your host, Deborah Weinswig, CEO and founder of Coresight Research. Thanks so much, Drew, and good morning, everyone. We are really excited and very honored today to have this opportunity to discuss the current gaps in retail merchandising execution. It's a topic that, you know, in 2020 has really been on the top of many people's lists. And we're very honored to sit here today and chat with Tom Erskine, who's the CEO of One Door. Tom leads a team that's committed to not only transforming retail merchandising, but also really putting the power into the hands of the retailers and truly helping CPGs better understand the transparency and the opportunity around you know, merchandising execution. Tom is re you know, really regarded as a true thought leader in the industry, and especially around the impact of AI, cloud, and mobile technologies in retail, and digital transformation of the store associate experience, which is also mission critical right now. He's a frequent speaker. Many of you have probably seen him on stage at you know, NRF's Big Show, uh, the CMA Annual Conference, and uh, these days virtually, uh, like we are today. He also holds multiple US and international patents in customer experience, networking, process transformation, and business support systems. Tom, we wanna to welcome you to the virtual stage with us today. Great, thanks. Great to be here. Thanks, Deb. Thank you so much. So as we you know, kind of look at the next slide and think about the agenda for today. We are you know, kind of very focused as it were on, you know, what kind of, you know, what are retailers utilizing? Um, and as we think about, you know, the objective and methodology of the research that we did together, understanding the retail merchandising execution gap, and then, you know, the use of merchandising software and its impact on cost savings. And, and most importantly, and what everyone wants to know is like, what, what is the path forward? Yeah. So, and, and these are, you know, and there's obviously many, many other topics to discuss as well. And so as we go to the next slide and, you know, think about the, the research that was done, you know, quite global as, you know, we look here based in China, Germany, the UK and the US. You know, really focusing, you know, as today, it's very important, not only online, but offline. And then we looked at certain sizes of companies and, you know, very senior folks and those who are responsible for category merchandise, category management, merchandising, uh, retail marketing, and customer insights and analytics, which is also mission critical. And then once again, hold, you know, holding roles with significant strategic decision-making responsibilities. So, you know, it was a, a very in-depth kind of approach. Tom, what were you most surprised, you know, as we looked at some of these results? Um, I think surprise versus, I, you know, I think it, it overall it continues to surprise me that um, many retailers still sort of continue to see this process as a process that's very, um, it's very HQ centric. So they're, they're, you know, when we look at sort of the merchandising process and merchandising in general, um, you know, I think the research reinforces what we see, which is altogether surprising, which is that, that retailers still see merchandising as kind of an HQ out activity and don't really understand the cross-functional nature of who's on the merchandising team, I guess, as it were. And so I think we're, you know, we continue to sort of see a market where um, retailers begin to recognize that um, sort of the most important people in the merchandising process are the thousands of employees out on the field that are setting shelves every day. Um, and so, you know, everyone on the team needs to be a part of uh, a collaborative approach and sort of a team-based approach to executing and making sure merchandising is getting done right. Um, and so I think it's, it's just a little bit surprising that we continue to see as, a, as, a, as an industry um, a little bit of a lag in the transformation of merchandising processes in that regard. So you're still seeing, our, you know, for the most part, you know, these plans being communicated from, from HQ as opposed to at the local level and, and thereby, right, if the stores and the associates don't feel that like they own it, that has all kinds of implications. 
Sure does. It, it absolutely does. And, and I think that one of the, one of the interesting things is, is that as retailers spend more on AI and analytics at headquarters to really understand and gain insight into customer behavior, um, they're, they're being very prescriptive about their merchandising plans. They're being, you know, they're, they're really asking stores to follow the prescription in terms of what gets set and what gets put on every shelf. Um, and so it, it's a little surprising that as they do that, um, yeah, we're, we're still seeing sort of definitely a, uh, almost like a send and pray uh, processed approach to merchandising, you know, and just sort of throw it over the wall and throw it up on an intranet site and good luck. Uh, and, and we obviously, you know, think that that, um, think that that has impacts. And I think the research sort of validates that that has significant impact on how ultimately this ends up getting done. No, absolutely. And then you know, as we advance a few slides, the, you know, this to me is, you know, just kind of mission critical in terms of visualizing, you know, kind of where execution should be and how it should kind of almost, you know, spotlight out is how I kind of think about it. And, you know, some of these questions, right, are, are the store teams actively and regularly reviewing instructions from headquarters? Also, how are they getting the instructions, right? And in some cases, right, things are in some stores, uh, you know, still faxed and whatnot, but also too, right, if, if the instructions are, if you will, held with the, the managers and the associate managers, depending on how those are, are communicated and cascaded down to the store associates, that's where we sometimes see a breakdown what are you seeing from that perspective and how, you know, how kind of accurate is some of this compliance reporting as well? Yeah. So I think one of the things to understand contextually is, is that um, a lot of the initial processes that were created to sort of solve for this um, and a lot of the tools that were created to solve for this at this point are, are really old. You know, the, the planogram was literally invented by Kmart in 1970. So at this point, it's a 50 year old idea. Um, and it, it, so, you know, when you, when you take today's requirements for, you know, much faster uh, sort of, much faster transformations in stores and a much more reactive approach to customer demands for new product launches and, you know, stores not doing three big resets a year, but instead doing maybe, you know, 12 to 24 smaller resets in an annual on an annual cycle. Um, when you try and throw that need for agility on top of kind of a 50 year old process, um, things go pear shaped in a hurry, you know. And and so what we end up with is, as you've just described, sort of, yeah, you know, this slide does a nice job, critically identifying that both the communication out from headquarters, then the actual work that gets done in the store, and then any type of feedback from headquarters is in a lot of cases missing. One of the consistent themes we hear when we talk to merchandising teams is that they have no idea what happens after they sort of hit send. And, and they feel a little bit like you know, that we call it the, is this mic on problem, which is that they're, they're sort of speaking out to the stores, but they're, they just have no idea whether the stores are actually listening. And obviously that's something that, that in this day and age with mobile technology, with cloud, et cetera, you know, these are problems that can be solved for sure. Tom, I always learn from you. I did not know that the planogram was invented by Kmart, but but that that actually brings up something you know that you talked about with regards to, to resets, and you know if we think about not only from a let's call it essential and non-essentials, right? On the non-essentials, we're seeing this move to like seasonless, and if we're starting to move to right truly 52 weeks, I mean we've heard this over and over from many retailers during you know 2020 for for many reasons that just adds so many different levels of complexity to what is already a complex process. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. And, and we're exactly, we're seeing exactly the same thing. And what, what, what we're excited to say, you know, is that a lot of the clients that we work with, the customers we work with as part of working with them, one of the things that, that we do with them 
is get them on a regular cadence of communication. So instead of only communicating with store teams when there's a reset, they're literally communicating to their stores every night or every week on a regular basis on the changes required so that the stores come to understand and expect that you are moving to this sort of much, much less sort of much less seasonal and it's not about sort of a big heavy lift every couple of months. It's more incremental activity that you're doing on a nightly basis or on a weekly basis. That makes a huge amount of sense. And then if we go to the next slide, the you know kind of real impact of what we're seeing is this opportunity, I think, to to change, you know, kind of not that right, everyone, as you said, everyone's got software. Much of it is uh, you know, been there for some time. And I think that there is definitely a focus, you know, I think a lot of what we learned this year that there is an opportunity to, to improve, not only, I mean, in stock is number one, number two, we're, you know, we're hearing this idea about, right, localization, which I thought had been addressed many, many years before, but you know, we're, we're learning all kinds of things this year. And I would say the, the two biggest pain points are, right, kind of in stock, and this idea of local, right? And, you know, this idea of the store feels like it's mine as a consumer and, and also from a sales associate and, and store manager perspective. Were these stats as you would have expected or how did these fall out versus what you had previously believed to be true? Um, I think a little bit uh, as expected, but with a big asterisk or caveat, which is you alluded to, which is, um, you know, most mature retailers have got something. You know, they have planogramming software from Blue Yonder or they've got something from Symphony or they, or, you know, maybe even upstream of that in their category management and range and assortment process, they're using software. So that there's merchandising software being used in the market for sure. I think what what is interesting though is that software tends to stop um, kind of at a critical point where, again, you know, best practice in the industry today is, yeah, we use, pro we use software for our planning process. Um, and then we throw it up on an intranet somewhere and the stores are left to their own devices to go figure it out for themselves. Um, and so I think everyone would say, yeah, we're using merchandising software. But the question is, is how complete is their stack as it relates to the overall merchandising process. And I think what we generally see is, is that as you start getting closer and closer to the shelf, um, the use of software declines significantly. Why, why do you think that is? Um, just because it's, because, um, you know, retailers have been a little bit slow to adopt kind of, it, well, let's step back. To make it work, you need cloud, you need mobile, you know, you, you, you need to be able to put stuff in the hands of store associates. And to do that, you need cloud and you need mobile. And, you know, retailers have been relatively slow to adopt cloud-based solutions, relatively slow to adopt, um, you know, mobile devices in stores have been around for a while, but in a lot of cases, they print proprietary closed systems like Zebra, et cetera. And that's all changing now. You know, most of the Zebra devices run Android. There's a much more higher comfort level with people using mobile devices, their own or store bought or uh, retail bought. So, you know, these are the things that change it. Do you, one, one other question before we move to the next slide. Do you find a difference in terms of size of retailer, you know, merchandise category that they're selling? What are you seeing in terms of similarities or, or differences as it relates to you know this question, yeah, um, um, size is size is a big part of it. Number of stores is a big part of it, right? So if you're if you're a smaller retailer with you know let's say less than fifty stores, um, you can probably manage communication using sort of generic tools, etc., or manage merchandising and the sort of communication of merchandising stores using those types of tools. As you start to increase the number of stores, um, your ability to do that effectively declines significantly. And then similarly, 
the efficiency gains that you get from putting world-class tools in the hands of store associates, obviously the more associates you have, the bigger the bang you get out of that is. And so um, larger footprint stores with lots of, uh, where there are lots of locations um, become big, uh, big, big drivers of, of doing a better job building a complete solution. Okay. That's, that's really helpful. And then, you know, as we move forward, uh, what we see is, you know, to me, I, this is, you know, I, I'm all about like the data and, you know, kind of the insights and then how we can drive actions and, and reactions. But, but these pain points, I mean, I, I truly feel, and I'm sure you do too, right, the, the pain that, and it's, you know, I mean, we, we always say, you know, we can throw out this, this solution and make it seem so easy, but I think, Tom, the way that you approach it, right, it really is a complex problem. It's, it's not easy. And I think understanding the pain points and for you, you know, to be able to have these conversations with retailers, right, and to really understand, right, I mean, this idea, right, this whole planogram idea was 50 years ago. Right. right? We need to move our, our thinking forward, right, at, at a pretty rapid pace. And, and while 2020, we've seen many topics uh, where I think we've seen investment we hadn't expected, I do feel this area is one where, you know, the retailers have stayed on the trajectory that they were on. How do you think 21 looks? Um, well, I think <laughs> for us, 21 looks great, which is nice. Uh, so I think that people are beginning to really wake up to the gaps here. Um, I think the, for me, what's, um, there, there's a couple key things. One is that um, we definitely hear a lot more than we did, let's say, 12 months ago, 24 months ago, from HQ merchandising teams that identify this, that, that identify with what you're describing here, which is this sort of, God, we just feel like we, we don't understand what's really happening in our stores, right? We, we have, a, and we're being held more, and those people tell us that they're being held more accountable for the ultimate result. So whereas a year ago or two years ago, they might have thought of the goal of their job being, hey, my job is to create great plans. Now they're being held accountable for the delivery of great merchandising versus just building a plan. And that once that becomes the goal that they're held accountable to, their needs change. And so you start to see, wow, I all of a sudden I really need to understand what's happening in the field because there's nothing worse than as a merchandising team, getting a call from somebody in your senior leadership in your organization that just got a call from somebody in senior leadership for one of your CPG uh, providers saying that they had just visited a store and they were supposed to get eight feet of run on something and they only got four feet and they're mad and wondering why. So there, we're definitely seeing that come around. And then the other big trend that's driving some of this is um, compliance, merchandising compliance is becoming more complex because so many stores are now being used as fulfillment locations where products for curbside or those types of delivery vehicles, those products are actually being picked off shelves. And so you're seeing, uh, you know, all of a sudden the need to understand where everything is in a store and also the need to make sure that stores are stocked appropriately, et cetera, is both becoming more complicated and becoming more important all at the same time. You know, you bring up a very important point where, especially on the, let's call it the, the discretionary side or, or non-essentials, but I remember from an apparel and footwear perspective, right? Many of these retailers were like, well, it says we have three on the shelf, you know, at, we're not really sure if it's in stock or not, so we're not gonna fulfill right from store. And, and so then you end up with lost sales. Right. So it's, it's the, you know, it's the, these challenges kind of build on top of each other. And, you know, at this point in the game, I'm, I'm sure the retailers would love to sell like the, the remaining three items, if indeed that they are there on the shelf or if they can be, you know, located somewhere in the store. How do you, how do you see us kind of moving that, that conversation forward? Uh, it's just going to take, it's just going to take time and effort <laughs> like anything. I mean, I think um, what, but it, you know, a concerted effort to really understand um, not only what's in a store, but where it is. Um, 
you know, will become a bigger and bigger deal here as we go forward. And especially for retailers in, in segments where their stores are really going to serve as hybrid uh, sales space and fulfillment space over the next, you know, three to five years. So I think a lot of retailers have a vision that they're going to end up with dark stores or they're going to end up with kind of micro fulfillment centers. And that's fine. Um, but I think that's a long-term vision. And I think it's very likely here that in the next three to five years, we're going to be operating in this hybrid mode for a long time where, hey, you know, I understand Nirvana, but the fact is, is that for the time being, the only way we can operate is to pick, be picking product and be picking orders off our shelves. No, absolutely. And I think that the, uh, the poll results are really interesting, especially kind of questions two and three, which is literally split right down the middle. So for those of you viewing the poll results, right, do you currently have a process in place to communicate directly with field teams to resolve in-store execution issues, 50-50? And then are you currently using merchandising software that allows you to confirm accuracy of plans, also 50-50? Right. Is so that's, a, that's, that's a big difference from the 85% of people that said they were using merchandising software. So I think it starts to, starts to show you what happens closer to the store, right? I, I think that that is that is exactly right, and you know I I really appreciate you, and we can advance you know to the next slide is that this whole conversation right because we're starting to look at this idea of nodality, right where right the stores and and the challenges right when you pick from them, then it can be first of all it's not as pleasant of an experience for the customer. I think the data we've seen is after you hit about thirteen to fifteen percent of product that's being picked versus being shopped by customers. You know, you really need to move to some kind of a dark store, or micro fulfillment center, and what we're seeing, right, is even in the same centers, it's it's unbelievable, right, the change that's occurred. Even in the same centers, we're starting to see that. So you can have right curbside pickup, Bopus, and and you then have these staging centers. At the same time, we still have, you know, that that does place, I think, almost more pressure on the stores because the consumer goes to let's say this this you know kind of staged store. And then they're like, wow, this is phenomenal. I'm gonna go back to right the 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 store and, and start to shop. And so their expectations also, I believe, are going to be raised because they've just had this tremendous pickup experience, right? When they're in stores, it, the experience needs to be matched. How do you see, right? I feel customer expectations have been very much elevated because this move to Bopus curbside pickup and also online has been somewhat seamless. Yeah, yeah, no question. I, 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 I just had a great in-store experience uh, at a DIY um, store over the weekend. I, I think the um, the big thing for me is that the store experience, the, the from a merchandiser perspective, the the problem the problem's not getting any easier if you're a merchandiser. It's actually getting harder from a space planning, from a merchandising and space planning perspective, and you know, all the way out to the execution. It's actually getting harder because as, as you operate in this hybrid mode and customer expectations like you described are as high as they are, um, you now have an additional constituent that you have to plan your space for, which is you were planning your space all around the customer experience 24 months ago. It was all you cared about was how do customers experience this space. Now, all of a sudden, you have to plan your space around a whole different constituent, which is, um, you know, the professional shopper, right? It's the either the Instacart shopper third party or it's your own store teams in stores trying to efficiently pick products for fulfillment of orders. And so now, you know, the your world, if you're in the space planning, visual merchandising, and then in the execution part of this, and your world just got a lot more complicated. And you have to do all of those things to deliver a good customer experience ultimately for the end consumer. And I think we're, um, we're definitely seeing pressure on these teams to, uh, to advance and, and sort of change the way stores are merchandised to accommodate these new, uh, these new customers. This is an excellent way to put it. I mean, not only is it becoming more complicated, but with these professional shoppers, it, you know, once again, their expectations also, I think everyone's expectations have just elevated. And, right. and what I really like about the slide is it's, you know, I think there's also expectations that more can be done for less and that, right, 
implementing some of these software solutions, right, that there's a really quick ROI. Yeah. As you've seen, and, and I mean, and, and ROI can be measured in many different ways, but how, you know, how do you see and think about, right, these, you know, because it's not only, to me, it's not only about reducing costs, right, it's also about improving efficiencies and operations, so therein lies the, the ROI, but do you find, it's, it, it, it's an interesting thought process because I feel that it's changed over time, are retailers and brands more focused on reducing costs or elevating the, you know, experience in the top line as a result of some of these merchandise software solutions? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's it's funny. So I'll, I'll share sort of some internal one door, um, you know, d a little bit here. But I, you know, five years ago, or, or when we started down this road five years ago, we were laser focused on top line growth from a from a benefit perspective, and this idea that man, you know, when customers find what they're looking for, sales go up, and compliance is everything. And store compliance drives sales, and and that is absolutely one hundred percent true. Um, I think what's happened along the way is that as the as we've improved the solution and as we've delivered a better experience for store associates, what we've started to realize is that in many ways, what what drives the initial interest in the platform and the solution is just pure cost savings and efficiency. And the fact that if someone can, you know, if, if, if every night we can save a couple of minutes in front of every shelf across thousands of stores, across 300 and something nights a year, um, ultimately that drives just massive savings for these organizations. And so we end up seeing in many ways, the primary initial benefit here, the initial driver is, man, we can, we can save money. And then ultimately, we understand that in addition to that, we're increasing the quality of the execution, just like you said. We're improving the customer experience, and ultimately, we're driving sales. And we have good data that sort of links compliance to sales. Um, it's there. I mean, and obviously, again, you know, when customers find what they're looking for, they buy more. Um, but uh, cost savings is a massive driver here. Yeah, and as, as we look ahead on the next slide, I mean, it, it is really interesting because, you know, there, there is a lot of science that goes into a lot of this compliance. And, you know, that's where I always have felt, you know, sometimes you talk to store managers, oh, well, you know, the, the plan says to put it here, but I think it's better here. And, you know, I, I do think that there's something to be said about also, I mean, I, mean, I think it's, a, it's almost a service, right, to not only, you know, having the software in place, but explaining, right, throughout the organization, it goes all the way, you know, from, from top all the way down to, to the bottom and, and everybody in between, just the, the power and what it actually delivers. And I, I think that, you know, we, we look around this idea right here around communication, right, and availability of real-time insights. It, it really, there are some significant gaps. Software can solve that because it also improves communication, yeah. which to me is, you know, really the, if we talk about Nirvana, that is, you know, kind of as we look ahead, really what's, what's mission critical. Tom, when you look at this slide, where do you feel the, the greatest opportunity kind of close gap, you know, from a merchandising solution um, perspective, where do those lie? Yeah, the, the, when you look at the two boxes on the right here, I, I think that what we still see in terms of just massive opportunity in front of most retailers is that providing, providing you know, thousands of associates in stores that are doing the work in front of the shelf every night providing them with world-class digital tools that enable them to do their job better um, still presents just a massive opportunity for retailers. And then the second big opportunity is now once you do that, you all of a sudden have this incredible new rich set of data coming back to you at, at headquarters. And you all of a sudden have the ability to truly have kind of x-ray vision in real time with regards to what's, what's actually going on on your shelves. And you get that, you know, almost for free because you, you got that just because you essentially enabled your associates with these types of tools. So you don't have to go out and, you know, install cameras everywhere. You don't have to hire 
third party audit firms that came in after the fact. You don't have to hear from your CPG partners two weeks later. You, you're getting that sort of real time x-ray vision that just presents you and provides this new rich set of data on top of which you can then turn around and make much better merchandising decisions. And so I think from our perspective, those are the two real opportunities. No, that makes a, a ton of sense. And, you know, we, we think, especially as we look to 21, this is a, a significant area of opportunity in terms of investment and also the, the ROI. So we have many questions in the queue, so we'll, we'll address as many as we can. Uh, so let's, let's start off, we'll really just start at the top. Um, what is your perspective on the recent shifts by retailers to manage in-store execution in-house, in-source? Um, well, again, I, I think our perspective, and I, I, Deb, you know, you, you probably have a pretty broad perspective. I think as a, as a software and technology provider, um, it, it relates to what I just talked about, which is this idea of really understanding and getting x-ray vision into what's happening. Um, you know, we see that as probably a result of the fact that retailers understand that they want to understand, they, they need better, more real time information about what's really happening in their stores. And, and it's probably the sort of the big driver around the insource and quality probably also has something to do with it as well. This may be my favorite question I've ever had. So I, I want to thank uh, Sam for asking this. Um, how do we grow our business through, you know, a, a new software tool like this one, <laughs> right? Cause it's just about growth, right? Like how do we think about this idea of top line, right? I mean, it's like, you know, open the kimono, Tom, share, share with us all, you know, all your secrets. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that the, you know, as a growth vehicle, probably two big areas. One is, again, back to this idea of merchandising quality and sort of top line growth through just delivering a better customer experience and ensuring that products are where they're supposed to be. Uh, that's, that's the no brainer. But the other one that's a little more, maybe a little more obscure, but still really important is we talked up front about agility and the ability, once you have an effective communication vehicle from headquarters to stores and back as it relates to merchandising, it's magical in terms of your ability to now turn around and respond so much more quickly to what you're seeing in data around the products and services that you should be presenting and marketing to the customer base. You know, you, you can be much more reactive to customer demands if you can much, you know, if you can set shelves more quickly, change sets more quickly, et cetera. And I think that is among the things that most retailers you recognize they've got to be able to do. Absolutely. We're, we have a long list of questions, but we're just going to have time for one last one. So thank you, Jack. How do you think the pandemic will impact in-store merchandising execution? Um, well, uh, one of the biggest things is um, there is obviously an increase you know, sort of PPE and all of this sort of safety issues associated with store, stores and the teams that work in those stores um, becomes a critical layer that, that has to be factored into the merchandising execution process. So literally just to talk about what that means. Um, for example, as part of the visual merchandising planning, we've seen customers through the pandemic for whom, you know, reconfiguring stores to more effectively enable social distancing and the deployment of PPE has become a significant part of their visual merchandising plan and budget. Uh, and so that's, you know, right off the top, that's, that's one aspect. And then the other is that consumer behavior in the pandemic has definitely changed to an approach where consumers are much more likely to kind of hunt down a product in a store and kill it versus browse. And so you have um, your merchandising strategies and space strategies are definitely changing to accommodate your ability to enable customers to sort of get in and get out more quickly. Um, and, you know, giving up and not spending as much time trying to create sort of browsing experiences and sort of serendipitous experiences. So. It's really interesting that, that we end on that note because I do find that, I mean, hey, right, you know, 
not not only are we you know in the year 2020 but right hindsight is 2020 right i mean the very interestingly many and this is at the c-suite they're you know kind of I, I think they continue to question themselves over the investments they've made on you know kind of experiential retail but we didn't know that we were right now the experience is being in stock right i mean that's that's the experience these days that's yeah. why the software is just so critical yeah. because right if it's not on the shelf right you can't buy it and that to the consumer right now is really i mean that's table stakes that's everything so i i, I want to tom this is i could have talked to you all day this is one of my kind of passions because right the consumer ultimately right they have a certain level of expectations i do think that that has gone to an entirely different level this year but it really is all about execution. And I always feel that, you know, there, there is this disconnect between HQ and the stores. There is science and there is a lot of work that's put into, you know, play to, to develop these, you know, planograms of old, but, you know, kind of how merchandise should be displayed and, and the kind of cross-selling opportunities. So, so thank you. I also want to let all of our listeners know we have a really special event on December 8th. And, and Tom, I know you're going to have a front row seat. Uh, it's a charity I actually started back in early days of the pandemic in March called Retailers United. And we have amazing people on our board, like Kay Unger from Parsons. Uh, we have a uh, very deep board and advisory board, uh, Tammy Fursco from Lian Fung and uh, Bryce Wu from Komodo Health. And we are um, going to be giving away $10,000 to one lucky startup who has faced unprecedented change during uh, 2020. And all of you will be there to help us vote on who gets that. And then we also have three technology startups who are very early stage uh, from RevTech. And they'll be talking about how they can assist some of these startups. And, and Tom, honestly, I believe much of what you're doing, uh, they could use your help as well. So look forward to having you there. Look forward to all of you joining us once again, December 8th at noon, uh, very much a give back. Tom, thank you for your insights and uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Great, well, thanks to the Corsair team. Thank you, Deb. We really enjoyed it and we'll talk soon. Take care, bye-bye. Take care.